Do you have a, a welcome mat at your door? You know, there's a difference between a welcome mat and a doormat. A doormat is a woven piece of cloth in which you wipe your feet or leave mud or remove your shoes. Although they look a little bit the same, the doormat says, wipe your feet, fool. Whereas the welcome mat says something different. It says, come on in. We're glad you're here. You're among friends. And, oh, wipe, wipe your feet. In our journey from earth to heaven, from the temporary to the eternal, we are received into glory with a welcome mat placed there by our loving Savior. There's something something better at the, than a pot of gold at the end of life's rainbow. Because of the work of Christ, there's a welcome mat receiving us into heaven with an enthusiastic reception. Christ welcomes us. We are welcomed into a relationship with God. We're welcomed into eternal life. We are welcomed into a forever relationship with Christ, beginning right here, right now. So how does the work of Christ welcome us into heaven, welcome us into this relationship with God? Well, first of all, Christ appears for us. Hebrews 9, 24 says, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered into heaven itself, now appearing for us in God's presence. Do you know what a sanctuary is? It is by definition a holy place, a shelter, a house of worship it is a place where God and humanity have direct contact. According to Hebrews, Christ has not entered a man-made sanctuary. The writer clearly states that Christ didn't just enter, enter the tab tabernacle or the temple. Nothing built by human hands. Instead, Christ entered into the one true sanctuary, heaven itself. Christ entered the place of God. It was there that Christ had direct communication with the Father. When matters are serious enough, we desire that that kind of communication, that face-to-face, -face, that we want to talk directly. Maybe a big business deal, a, a wedding proposal, or, or multinational negotiation. When, when matters are of grave concern, we want direct communication. No substitute for the real thing will do. Now, I thought this would have been a good place to put a joke about how we communicate these days with the, with the emojis. And I, and I scoured the internet looking for a joke such as that, but I couldn't find one because... All those jokes, well, they were told in emoji, which I guess kind of makes my point for me. Christ has entered heaven into the presence of God to appear for us. Christ used direct communication to plead our case before God. Christ has taken our needs, our problems, our fears, and our pain directly to God. What a joy it is to know that Christ has already paved the way for us on our journey. Christ has appeared for us and for our sake to the Almighty, Holy God. Second of all, 
Christ sacrifices for us. Verses 25 and 26 tell us, Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year, with blood that is not his own. In verse 25, the writer of Hebrews refers to the Old Testament sacrificial system. Year by year, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, the, the Day of at one as I'll say sometimes, and offer a sacrifice for his sins and for the sins of the people. The sacrifice that was required was the blood of animals. In contrast to this system, Christ has made the one and only sacrifice. Instead of the sacrifice of animals, Christ offers the sacrifice of himself, which was sufficient for all our sins, for all time. Notice the, the key phrase in, in verse 26, to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. To be a, a good host, to truly welcome someone into your home, you have to make some sacrifices. There is the effort to clean the house, to do the cooking, to prepare the table, to work in the yard, to get things just right. Christ has made everything just right by his sacrifice. By offering his life before God, we are no longer enslaved by sin. We are no longer guilty under God's law. We are free. By his sacrifice, Christ has made it possible for us to be in fellowship with the Holy God, beginning right here, right now, and forever. Third of all, Christ saves us. Verses 27 and 28 tell us, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that the day of judgment is coming. There will be an end to this life. We will be held accountable for what we've done and for what we've left undone. Judgment will come. But verse 28 reminds us that Christ has removed our sin. He's coming again not to remove sins a second time, as though the first sacrifice was incomplete. Instead, he comes to bring salvation. In modern times, we define a host of relationships by, by contract. These are usually for goods and services or hard cash. The contract, be it formal or informal, helps to, to specify failures in these relationships. The Lord did not establish a contract with us. He created a covenant. There's a difference. Contracts are broken when one of the party parties fail to keep their promise. If let's say a patient fails to keep an appointment with a doctor, the doctor's not obligated to call the house and say, where were you? Why didn't you show up? 
No, he just simply moves on to his next patient. And then he also has his appointment secretary take note that this patient failed to keep their appointment. The patient may find it harder in the future to, to see the doctor because he had broken an, an informal contract. Of course, these days, we sign an actual contract with our doctors. They call it paperwork. But this binding contract says that if we miss an appointment, they have the right to charge us. According to the Bible, however, the Lord asks, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion over the child that she born, that she has born? Though she may forget, says the Lord, I will not forget you. The Bible indicates the covenant is more like the ties between parent and her child than it is between a doctor and his patient. If a child fails to show up for dinner, the parent's obligation, unlike the doctor's, is not canceled. The parent must find out where the child is and make sure he or she is cared for. One member's failure does not destroy our relationship with God. This covenant is an unconditional commitment to love and serve. The day of judgment for those people of faith will not be a day of fear, but rather a day of grace. It will be a day in which we are reminded that Christ loved us so much that he gave himself in our place. Instead of eternal pun punishment, Christ says to us, welcome. We are glad you're here. You are among friends. Two brothers fought, fought all day, and their mother had had enough, and she made that final eternal proclamation, wait till your father gets home. They did so with fear and trembling. And then the father came in. In that place where he was about to make his, I'm going to spank you speech, and he, he pulled back the edge of his coat, and he says, do you see this belt? And they looked. They didn't see a belt. The father had well, what they used to call sans belt slacks. No belt in sight. So instead of a beating, they received hugs. How about that? They thought they were really going to get it. Wait till your father gets home. But instead, they received something that they did not expect something that they did not deserve, grace. Christ saves us from what we deserve right here, right now, and forever. The road to God is made up, is made open by Christ's work for us. The welcome mat is out not only at the end of our journey, but at any point along the way. Christ is there offering an enthusiastic reception, welcoming us. Come on in. I'm glad you're here. You're among friends. Amen. And amen.